quite, quite lovely to be out in the sun a little bit, out in nature. And what a privilege it is to worship God freely like this. I will try to keep my voice nice and loud so you guys can hear me at the back. Um, but we're going to do our, our Sunday school. I've put a little play together and I'll do the reading. But a big part of this play is that you guys sing with. We're going to interrupt the reading with different Christmas carols at different times. So we encourage you as the congregation, join with the children as we praise the Lord and we celebrate the birth of our Savior. Just before I begin, I just want to open up in a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we get to spend time on a Sunday to worship the only name that deserves our praise, that deserves our worship. Lord, we pray that from the mouths of babes, we will learn to praise your holy name. And I pray that we allow ourselves to worship you freely. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Caesar Augustus. And in that same re region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. 
haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them.
The reading for this passage was found in Luke chapter 2. And I, I want to say I think we've got the best sheep in the whole wide world. They were pretty amazing. It was, it was a, lovely, a lovely reminder to us about what this time is really about. And I trust that we, we allow the passage of Luke chapter 2 to remind us that this time of the year, yes, we celebrate the Lord's birth, but we celebrate so much more than that. We celebrate God's provision for our salvation. We celebrate the fact that God himself came to be with us. Emmanuel, Christ with us. It's not just about a birthday party. It's about so much more than that. It's a celebration looking toward the sacrifice Jesus was going to make for us. Some, someone as innocent as a child reminds us of his purity, of his divine holiness. And it is that sacrifice that buys our salvation. May we never forget that in a story such as the birth of Christ. That he made the sacrifice for whoever would confess and repent of their sin and follow and believe in him in faith and in hope. This morning's sermon ties in with that message. I'll be going through Psalm 111. So if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn there. We do have slides, but we have load shedding at 10. So hopefully you brought your Bibles. But before we get into that, let us pray. Yes, Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you. Thank you that from the mouths of babes we can be reminded of the most important intervention that has ever happened in our history, where you stepped in to make a way for us. Lord, I pray that as I preach your word this morning that you'll anoint my lips and that you'll make the message and the gospel very clear, that you'll convict our hearts in any area that needs convicting that you'll encourage us in any area that needs encouraging. But most of all, Father, that you'll edify your church, that you will build up your church as a result of this sermon. I pray in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now and then. But let us read Psalm 111, just the first verse for now. 
And it, the psalmist starts off wonderfully. But before I read, I just want to highlight that this is actually one of these amazing psalms where each line is actually a successive letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So it would start with A, and then the next line would be B, and then C. And they did this to help memorize the scripture. They did this to commit this to memory. And I trust that we take on that challenge to commit as much scripture to memory. And so the psalm reads this way. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright in the congregation. Praise the Lord. So the sermon title this morning is titled Ascribe Greatness. Ascribe Greatness. That is what this, this psalm is calling us to do. Here the psalm, he starts off by saying, Praise and give thanks with all your heart. And I came across this story to help illustrate what it means to praise and to give thanks with your whole heart. So that once upon a time, there was a businessman. And he was out on business and on his way home, he was at the airport and he decided, now he's going to try to buy his wife a bottle of perfume. And so he goes to the shop and the sales lady, she comes up with a bottle of perfume costing a hundred rand. And the man says, Oof, that's, uh, that's a bit pricey, is there? Do you have something else? The lady goes back and brings another bottle of 50 rand and he's like, mm. That's, that's still, that's a bit pricey. Do you have something else? She goes back and gets a 20 rand bottle of perfume. And the man's like, he's starting to get annoyed at this point. And then he says, well, I'm, I'm looking for something really, really cheap. And so the lady goes back, goes to the cupboard and comes back and presents him with a mirror. <laughs> Can we say... Can we say that this man loved his wife with his whole heart? Of course not. And, and the reason we say he, he cannot love his wife with all, all his heart is because he put so many other things above his wife. This isn't a, <laughs> we're assuming that this man wasn't under financial difficulties. The point of the story is that he wasn't willing to take a cost to bless his wife. There were lots of other ways he would rather have avoided a cost like that. And the question for me that stood out is do we approach the Lord with that same type of relationship? Where we say, Lord, I want to follow you, but as, as long as it doesn't hurt. As long as it's not difficult, are we not the same as the businessman? Do we approach the, our relationship with the Lord where we want to be good Christians as long as it doesn't hurt us? As long as it's not too difficult, as long as it's not too hard. We know the, the portion of scripture where Jesus answered the, the man who said, what's the greatest commandment? And, and the answer was, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. I see that echoed in verse 1 where it says, I will give thanks with all my heart, with my whole heart. And that's where I want to focus a little bit this morning. How committed are we to praising the Lord with all our heart? Are we, are we perhaps... We only save it for Christmas time. We only save it for the seasonal holidays where it's popular in our country to praise the Lord at this time. It's popular. We see everyone does it. Do we only reserve our praise for when it suits us? In other translations, verse 1 says, Praise the Lord and praise the Lord with all your heart, with your whole heart, instead of give thanks. Giving thanks and praising the Lord is very much the same thing. But I want to read a quote here 
by Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, he wrote, he has a lovely commentary on the Psalms called The Treasury of David. If you can get your, whole, your hands on that, I, I encourage it. But this is what he says about Psalm 111. He comments on this passage with these words, and he, he comments on verse 1, and he says, Praise ye the Lord, or hallelujah. All ye saints unite in adoring Jehovah, who works so gloriously. Then he comments and he says, do it now. Do it always. Do it heartily. Do it unanimously. Do it eternally. Even if others refuse, take care that you have always a song for your God. Put away all doubt, question, murmuring and rebellion and give yourselves up to praising of Jehovah, both with your lips and in your lives. I think Charles Spurgeon says it quite well there, but I want to emphasize what he said there at the end. I have to emphasize that we praise him with both our lips. That means out loud, that means verbally, that means on purpose, publicly, but then also in your life, which means every day, every part of you in daily practice. That is what verse 1 is really highlighting. But I want you to notice something about verse 1 as well. Praise the Lord and give thanks with all your hearts. But this person, the psalmist, is not found in isolation. Look at the, set, the last part of verse 1. Where is he praising the Lord? He is praising the Lord in the company of the uprights. In the congregation. That's a challenge to you and I. That's telling us today that when we gather together, we need to be zealous. We need to be passionate about our praise. We need to articulate the goodness of our God. We need to speak it out that the world may hear and know the goodness of our God. I want to say this very clearly this morning. Please allow your lips to speak of God's goodness. Do not allow the enemy to shame you with shyness. Timidness and, and shyness is no excuse not to praise God publicly. What's fascinating about this psalm in particular is they actually call it a personal psalm. It's an individual who's praising. It's not one that was for the congregation. And so the challenge to us is to, to ensure that we give no room for our enemy to quieten our praise. What stands in the way of our praise? And I'll get into that later, I hope trying to read my sermon notes here. I feel like I could preach the rest of the sermon on just verse 1. But what, what's fascinating about the psalm is that from verse 2 to 9, which is my next point, we've started with we have to praise the Lord publicly. We have to praise the Lord with our whole hearts. But now from verse 2 to verse 9, where we're going to look, the scripture goes and answers this question, why should I? Why should I praise God? And that's what we're going to look. So read with me from verse 2 to 9. And my second point, why should you praise the Lord with your whole heart? The scripture reads, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is His work, and His righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy 
They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Why should I worship God? I worship God because His works are great. His works are full of splendor and majesty. His righteousness endures forever. What He does is wonderful. He is gracious and merciful. He provides, He keeps His covenant with us. His works are powerful. He gives us an inheritance. What he does is faithful and just. His commands and his instructions are worthy of our trust and they last for eternity. He has redeemed us. His name is awesome and worthy of all honor and praise and glory. The scripture here bursts into these reasons and saying, Why praise? Well, today we have a much more wonderful opportunity. Look around you. Look at the trees. Look at the, this beautiful blue sky. Look at the birds. The real question is, what excuse do you have not to praise God? Are your circumstances more a reason to silence your praise? Is your financial situation perhaps big enough that you do not have to praise God? Surely not. Surely not. What possible reason can you think of that outweighs this list from verse 2 to 9? What possible reason outweighs the fact that our Lord is gracious and merciful? What reason outweighs the fact that he made a covenant with us and he keeps it? What excuse do we have not to praise and give thanks? Is there anything that can mute your praise? Only you can mute your praise. Circumstances can never mute your praise. Your situation can never mute your praise. It is your perception that mutes your praise. It's seeing your situation as bigger than what God has done that mutes your praise. It's allowing what's happening around you, what you see with your earthly eyes, that limits your praise. We know in Hebrews the definition given of faith is faith is the substance of things hoped for, the things not yet seen. We need to live our lives by faith as we live daily in faith that is when our, pr our our praise and our thanksgiving are evident no matter no matter the situations we find ourselves in and throughout scripture we find many examples of this we find david david commits a sin with bathsheba she falls pregnant and the child dies as soon as the child dies, what does David do? He goes to praise the Lord. We find David dancing in the streets. We find Paul and Silas singing in the prison. What will quieten your praise? What will silence your thanksgiving? We have the famous king, Jehoshaphat. How does he go to battle? With trumpets and he shouts God's praise because the battle is the Lord's. He was praising God in the very face of his enemy, in the face of death itself. What will quieten your praise? What will stifle your thanksgiving? I pray that you'll join me in saying nothing will. We will allow nothing to stop our thanksgiving. We'll allow nothing to stand in the way of our praise. Because the God who has provided for us, has done so much already. During this week, I said it already to, to someone, I said, if I were to die today, I would die the happiest man because of what God has already done for me up to this point. He owes me nothing more. 
I'm in a place where I never thought I'd ever be. Is that how we look at our lives? Are we grateful? Are we allowing praise to bubble up inside of us? Let us allow God to stir in our hearts today that we praise and we give thanks with our whole heart. Not just with a 20 rand bottle of perfume, but with our whole heart. Giving it our all. And that brings us to verse 10. The beauty of, of following God, of, of giving Him praise. Verse 1 is, praise the Lord, give thanks with your whole heart. 2 to 9 are the reasons why. And then verse 10, there's even a benefit for us if we praise God. There's even this beauty that God rewards us with when we follow Him. Verse 10 reads, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. This is an amazing thing. We know and we've seen often this phrase, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It sounds like a, a passage stolen from the Proverbs. But in this, in this chapter, what it's really saying is, if you are withholding your praise from God, you do not fear Him. Because you are withholding what He is rightfully due. In this chapter, it's saying, if you truly fear God, if you truly know how big and how powerful and how mighty our God is, you will know it is your duty, it is your obligation to give Him praise. And when we do so, we walk in wisdom. We are given wisdom and understanding when we practice it. Isn't that an encouraging part of verse 10? For those who practice it. God understands that there are times where we feel overwhelmed. He doesn't expect us to walk without fault. But He expects us to walk with perseverance. To run the race with perseverance. To never give up. There was, there's lots of wisdom and leadership videos I watch from time to time. And the one leadership principle is they allow themselves only five minutes of negativity. Five minutes of negativity to absorb the situation, to let the emotions... But then after those five minutes, they submit themselves to looking for the solution. That's a worldly principle. How much more should the, the, the church of God... Be equipped to say, after I've had the emotions, I turn to God's word. I declare that my God is bigger than my situation. That is what it means to praise God. It's not that your life is perfect, but that you declare the sovereignty of our Lord Jesus over all. The situation, the finances, your hopes, your dreams. You declare Jesus over it all. And those who do this, those who practice this, they're the ones with good understanding. Not the intellectual, not those who know more, but those who know that God deserves all the honor, all the praise, all the glory, and who live that out in their daily life. That's what it means to practice. It means to make this a part of daily living. It's not saying, know that the Lord is wonderful and mighty fear the lord in knowledge no practice the fear of the lord i want to i want to highlight something else in verse 10 god doesn't need your praise his praise endures forever that's how this finishes because god doesn't need you to praise him it's your duty to praise him the thing is god's praise god's glory is already established he has been praised from the very beginning. Jesus answered the Pharisees when the Pharisees came to him and said, tell your disciples to shut up. Because these disciples were saying, this is the king. And Jesus says, but if I told them to keep quiet, the very stones will praise God. Because God doesn't need you to praise him. His praise, his glory is already established. 
The question is not about his glory. The question is about, are you participating or are you spectating? Are you going to row in the same direction as the church giving praise to the only one who is, it is due? Or do you think you're better than that? That's actually the question. God is not dependent on us. We are dependent on Him. And that goes for the praise as well. That's why the psalm ends with His praise endures forever. Regardless of our choice. He's been praised from long ago. The, the psalm says that the heavens declare the handiwork of our God. We have the church fathers who planted the church. We have the apostles. All of these were praising God. His praise is already established. Where are you in your praise with God? That's actually the question of today. And that's very much what we saw in the story in chapter Luke, the birth of Christ. The shepherds had this moment where they encountered Jesus. The angels were already singing. His praise was already established. The shepherds had a choice. Do we worship him or do we walk away? They chose to walk away worshipping God, singing him and making him known. I'll say it again, as I said earlier. Do not allow timidness, shyness to rob God of the praise that he is due it is just that simple do not allow fear of man to rob you of the opportunity to live in wisdom and good understanding that is by giving God the praise and the thanks that he is rightfully due what excuse can we muster what excuse can we dream up that outweighs the greatness of what he has already provided. Let us keep that in perspective. There's that famous passage where Jesus talks about tax and he says, Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. Are we willing in every aspect of our life to give unto God what is rightfully his? Paul in, in Romans says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He understood that his entire life was no longer his own. It was all due to Christ. Are we any different to Paul? Are our lives not meant to be given wholeheartedly to the one who saved us on the cross? agree that we we have to answer that question with surely of course it is we have to live daily submitted to the calling of Christ and so I hope this morning you are encouraged that no matter what you're going through no matter what situations or circumstances have come your way that you are reminded you have an eternal home you have something no other person has. In verse 6 it talks about giving them an inheritance. You too, child of God, have an eternal inheritance. We see that in Hebrews. How much do you value that inheritance? How much is that a focal point in your daily life? May we give God all the praise and all the thanks. And may it be all for his will. Let us pray. Lord, I just, I thank you again. That we get the opportunity to gather together in unity to glorify your name. It is all about you, Jesus. I hear the wind in the trees and I am reminded of scripture. How the armies of Israel waited until they heard you and then they attacked and i pray that that echo to our lives that our lives are characterized by a waiting to hear your voice to hear you before we act i pray that 
the words of Psalm 111 will, will strike our hearts and encourage us to, to give you all the praise, give you all the thanksgiving in the assembly of the uprights, in the congregation to let our praises be loud, vocal and public. But Father, that it not only be loud and public, but that it transpire in the everyday actions of our lives. Father, I pray that we will use the psalm as a reminder that we have no reason not to give you praise and glory. That we have no excuse not to give you the glory, the honor and the power. And so, Father, I just want to say thank you. I pray that you be over your church, you anoint your church and you bless your church. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But I want to end off with, the, with what Paul writes to the Romans at the end of the book of Romans. And this is our prayer over you as a church. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed and through the prophetic writing has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us.